Cheating wife's lover offered her to go to sauna, but what then did next will shock you. Keep watching. Everyone was going to come to this party, dedicated to the 20th anniversary of graduation. They had called each other in advance and made arrangements. They were a very close-knit group, and over the five years of study, they had all become friends. Couples formed between the students and families appeared. After graduation, almost the entire group stayed in their hometown. No, some were sent to the periphery, but after compulsory work, the former students returned to their hometown. Many worked at the same enterprises, someone made a career, became a boss, and, imperceptibly, pulled up his former students. That's how Juan and Isabella's life turned out. They married in their fourth year of college and have lived together for 21 years. The children grew up and became independent. The daughter, a university student, married and lived separately. Her husband was an independent entrepreneur who had also studied at the university and after graduating from it, opened his own business. The daughter, in general, repeated her mother's fate. The younger son also studied, but refused to enroll in our city. He went to study in a neighboring city at a university with a strong computer science department and lived in an apartment there. Juan's parents lived across town, not far from Isabella's parents. Juan's entourage thought that Juan was under Isabella's thumb. That wasn't true at all. He wasn't subservient, or he wouldn't have made a career out of being a deputy CEO. He just never argued with his wife, trying to smooth out the rough edges. If necessary, he listened to her opinion and did things his way. Isabella didn't even notice it. They also had a close friend, Dolores, with whom they had been friends since their student days. She was always a welcome guest at all their celebrations. Dolores wasn't exactly lucky in life. She, like many of her class, got married. But she didn't live with her husband for long. By some ridiculous accident, his husband died. They had no children. From her husband, she was left a three-room apartment in the center, a decent amount of money in the bank account, which she inherited. She worked in the same office as Isabella. What set her apart from the others was her total selflessness. She was never jealous of anyone. She was always ready to lean on her friend's shoulder, to listen to her, to help, to warn. And now, when she met Juan shortly before the party, she said to him, You might want to cut Isabella some slack. She feels like a free wind, like this. She got involved with Diana at work. And Diana, she hates everyone, she's jealous of everyone, and she does all sorts of nasty things. You too? No, she's afraid of me. In our third year when we were studying, she did something to me. When I found out that she was the author, in the evening, in the dorm, she was so badly treated that she didn't show up at the university for two weeks. She's been avoiding me ever since. You could have called the police? No, I couldn't. I was dating my future husband at the time, and he was so tight. And if he knew what she'd done, he'd kick her ass himself. What did she do? That's a secret. But she's a very slippery person. She only cares about screwing up. She divorced her husband because of it. He told me it was always surprises. He got fed up, so he left, and a couple months later, he met his current wife. She tried to get in there, too. Juan knew with a sixth sense that Dolores was not telling the truth and that she knew more because she was in the same office with Isabella. But he did not inquire, promising that he would look after his wife. And here was the party. Everyone gathered in the restaurant, which, in addition to the hall on the second floor, had an adjoining winter garden. There, amidst strange plants, there were benches in secluded places where the diners could have some privacy. Nearby, there was a smoking room. Smoking was not allowed in the hall. On the first floor, there was a check room, a ladies and men's room, and a foyer with a front entrance. There was another mixed group of men and women in the restaurant that evening, also celebrating an anniversary. The floor was given to Beatrice, the permanent head of the group. In a brief speech, she remembered those who could not attend the celebration today remembered the teachers and noted with sadness that those who had taught them 20 years ago had retired. And the university has a completely renewed teaching staff. Nevertheless, 
everyone drank to the graduates. Then there were toasts to the teachers, to the ladies present here, and simply, how great it is that all of us are here today. The dancing began. Juan drank a little while Isabella got carried away. You bet, there were friends around. After a few dances with her husband, she started dancing with other partners as well. Juan noticed Isabella sitting at a table with her friends and discussing something furiously with Diana. Just the usual womanizing talk, and he didn't pay much attention to it. After another 15 minutes, he noticed Isabella doing a slow dance with a man not in their circle. And after a couple more minutes, he saw that she had disappeared from the dance floor. She wasn't at the table either. One of the fellow students responded to his question, Where is Isabella? Answered, She went into the conservatory. With some guy. Juan walked over there. Something clicked in his head and he turned on his cell phone camera, filming everything he saw. There weren't many people there, and as he walked to the end of the conservatory, he saw that Isabella was sitting on a man's lap with her arms around him, and they were kissing. He walked over to them, grabbed Isabella by the shoulder, turned her around to face him, and asked, Can you explain to me what's going on here? Isabella replied in a drunken voice, Juan, meet Santiago. He's such a nice guy. We have so much in common. I'm sure you'll be friends. The guy, more sober, asked, Who are you? I'm her husband, actually. I'm sorry, but she told me that she is single, that she is a free woman. Isabella intervened and ruined everything. Honey, why are you so jealous? Why are you following me? You don't let me live. Yes, we sat with Santiago. We talked. Don't you have enough other girls in the gym? Go on, I won't be jealous. And don't stop me from celebrating. Juan turned around and went to the exit. He met Dolores in the hall and asked, Where do you go? Where's the wife? She and Santiago are kissing in the conservatory. Before that, she was chatting with Diana. Where am I going? I'm going home. She better not be there. Don't boil. I warned you that Isabella is feeling free. She sees your non-confrontational behavior as weakness. She once said he'd run to the ends of the earth for me and dance to my music. And with Diane involved, it's not that simple. Go home so you don't make a mess. Think it over. I'll take her to my place for the night. With Santiago? If he's the man I think he is, he won't mess with married women. He's been beaten for it before, and more than once. This gallant gentleman is a common Alfonso. I'm off to the conservatory. Juan walked out of the restaurant, stopped a cab, and drove home without looking back. Dolores found Isabella in the winter garden. She was already sitting on a bench next to Santiago and trying to smoke a cigarette, which made her cough violently. Santiago encouraged her, saying, Come on, one more puff. Dolores, dressed in an elegant pantsuit, walked up to Santiago and, without saying a word, kicked him in the face. This sent him flying off the bench and covering his face with his hands. As he fell, he caught the cigarette in Isabella's hands, and it flew into the foliage. Isabella asked in surprise, Dolores, what are you doing? We were just kidding, and my husband's a joke. I won 100 rubles from Diana. Stupid, Diana's got you fooled. I heard in the ladies' room that she had a bet with Rodrigo for $500 that one of our saints will go to the winter garden with an out-of-towner, who we'd pick up at a restaurant. And now I realize that saint is you. What's there to explain? You don't understand anything. That's it. Party's over, let's go to my place. Santiago, seeing that he was no longer beaten, jumped up, apologized, and quickly walked away. Isabella looked at Santiago with an incomprehensible gaze and suddenly said, Your place? Are we going to continue the party there? Yeah, absolutely. Can we take Santiago with us? How about Juana? No, we're not taking Juan. He came in here arguing. He's been following me all night. All right, get up. Let's go out. They went outside, found a free car. The cab driver looked unhappily at Isabella, who couldn't stand properly on her feet. When he found out the address, he agreed because it was five minutes away from the restaurant. There, Dolores struggled to drag the drunken Isabella out of the car and into her driveway. 
I struggled to get her up to the floor. She dragged her home to the couch in the hall, and then Dolores lost her strength. She laid Isabella on the couch, took off her shoes, threw a pillow and a blanket on the couch. After some thought, she put a basin next to the couch. Just a minute later, Isabella's powerful snoring sounded. I went to the kitchen, warmed the kettle, and dialed Juan's number. He answered quickly, saying, I'm listening. Juan, it's Dolores. Anyway, Isabella is sleeping on my couch in the hall, drunk as a skunk. I don't think she'll remember tomorrow what happened tonight. Dolores, thank you, of course, but I'm not interested anymore. Isabella buried our marriage with her antics, and if she doesn't remember what happened today, I'll remind her. I recorded her kissing Santiago. I punched Santiago in the face. Why? If anyone should have been beaten, it was Isabella, but it was useless. Well, besides Isabella, Diana, it was her trick, after all. I heard the girls in the ladies' room discussing that Diana had bet Rodrigo $500 that one of our saints would go into the conservatory with her beau. So she got Isabella drunk. She played the, you can't get a man to take you to the conservatory card. The fool took the bait. I don't know the details, but it's not important. Dolores, I'm really not interested. After 20 years of marriage, you're getting a divorce? Yes, I've made that decision. I'll say more. I've sealed off the first floor of the house. She can enter the house, but from the hallway she can go to the hall, the kitchen, and the second floor. I kept the minimum, the entrance to the house from the bathhouse and two guest rooms on the first floor. One of them, my bedroom in the second, I will equip the office, there are all the communications, and the first floor toilet is mine too. It's impossible to get into my half of the hall, the door is blocked. Yeah, but you've got a garage, a car, a basement. That's right, I'll buy her share of the cottage in a couple months. With that money, she can buy an apartment in the city. I've transferred exactly 50% of our joint account to my account. Now I'm just moving my stuff downstairs. Juan, I thought you were going to fight for your marriage. That's what I thought when I left the restaurant. At home, I watched the video on my phone on the big screen, and I was disgusted. She, an old hanger-on, sitting on a young guy's lap and talking about how I don't let her live. Juan, she's drunk. There, there. And what's on a drunk's tongue is in a sober man's head. I don't need a cheating wife, especially as our general director is retiring and I have already been offered his place. And our company is very attentive to the impeccability of the personal lives of senior executives and their family members. Don't be silly. She's not that old, only 42 years old. What will the kids say? I don't know. The mom's video. I already sent it to them. Why? Not to be stopped. I burned the ships. There's no turning back. Juan, stop. Dolores, do you think I'm not hurt by what I saw in the Winter Garden? I still love Isabella, and I want her to remain my wife. And it pains me to know that she has betrayed our love. So I will do whatever it takes to make sure there's no going back. I will go through this pain, and I'm not going to take revenge on her, mind you. It's all in me. Okay. I've got a bunch of stuff to move into my room. Dolores went to the bedroom, passing through the hall, looked at Isabella, who was sleeping serenely. Trouble was just beginning, she thought. Morning has long since turned today. Saturday. I want to sleep, but someone is chattering insistently nearby. Dolores opened her eyes. Isabella was sitting on the ottoman beside her, moaning about her headache. Dolores, in a heartbeat, said, Isabella, stop it. It's your own fault. You got drunk last night. Do you even remember what happened? I don't remember. My head hurts. Dolores realized she wasn't going to get any more sleep, cursed inwardly, threw back the blanket and sat on the bed with her feet on the floor. She said, Wait for it. After that, I looked in the medicine cabinet and found a pack of activated charcoal, no seishpa, and aspirin. I put some water in a cup and brought it to my friend. She said, Ten tablets of activated charcoal, followed by two units of nosishpa and one aspirin. Are you trying to poison me? Then don't drink. 
Did they force you to drink alcohol last night? I don't remember. Where's Juan? Juan, who? My husband. Are you married? Dolores, are you kidding me? I don't know. Yesterday you and Santiago kissed in the winter garden. If it wasn't for me, you'd have woken up at his place today. Santiago, who? What are you making up? Where's Juan? Oh, yesterday there was a man named Juan. He came to the restaurant with his wife, but he left single. Stop fantasizing, I'll get him. He got me drunk and left me at my girlfriend's house. You're good too. At least you're a partition. Where's my phone? Try looking in your purse. I'm going to the kitchen for coffee. You want some? Yes, I will. Isabella found the phone. It was on silent mode. It had several dozen calls from her daughter and several dozen calls from her son. Isabella dialed her daughter, and when she answered, she said, Daughter, good morning. What's going on in there? Good morning, Mom. Nothing's wrong with me. What's going on with you and Dad? I'm fine. Where's Daddy? He went to the store. I'm going to Aunt Dolores's for coffee now. Oh, really? Daughter, of course it's true. Do you want Aunt Dolores? I don't need Aunt Dolores right now. Dad didn't go to the store. He's home now. Tell me about Santiago, who's such a nice guy, and with whom you have so much in common. Tell me how your dad watches over you and lets you live. Daughter, what are you talking about? I'm telling you what you told your father yesterday, sitting on Santiago's lap, and you kissed before. My father sent me the video. What video? You can ask him that when you get home from Santiago. But I'm at Aunt Dolores. That's it. Don't call me again. I don't want to know you after what you did. The daughter passed out. Isabella walked confusedly into the kitchen and asked Dolores, Tell me, what happened at the restaurant last night? Nothing. As I understand it, you picked up a guy and took him to the winter garden. You kissed there. I don't know if there was more to it than that, but Juan came in and saw you. The whole group saw the scandal. You accused your husband of stalking you, and Juan left. You embarrassed him in front of everyone and you made yourself look like a sellout. What was he supposed to do? I don't remember. I was drunk. What's this Santiago? I know this Santiago. He's a regular at this restaurant. Doesn't work anywhere, lives off rich women. What a shame. That's not all. You and Diana bet that you could get a man into the conservatory. And you did. You won 100 euros. Diana bet Rodrigo that a man would take you to the conservatory for $500, and she won. What a piece of crap. That's true. But who did you turn out to be? Isabella's phone rang. It was her son calling. Isabella answered. Hello, son. Hey, mom. So, are you and daddy getting a divorce? Come on, son. We're fine. I don't know. Judging by the video you sent me, that's exactly what's going to happen. Are you at home or at that young lover's house, who's basically my age? No, I'm here to see Aunt Dolores. And where were you coming from? Son, I spent the night at her place. She brought me home from the restaurant. Please don't think I cheated on my father. I love him. I just had too much to drink last night. Okay, Mom, just don't call me until you and Dad make up. I won't answer. The son disengaged himself. Isabella, even more confused, looked at Dolores and asked, Dolores, what do I do? I don't know. I honestly tried to stop Juan. I almost succeeded. He still wanted to stay married when he left the restaurant. But then when I called him back from home, he decided to end it. Where have I been? Here, lying on the couch, passed out. I'll call him. Call. I don't think he'll answer you. But Juan answered, after the third ring. He said dryly, I'm listening. Juan, darling, I'm sorry. I was stupid. No, it's fine. You can use the main entrance to the cottage. You still have the kitchen, the first floor lounge, and the entire second floor. I'm keeping the bare minimum, two guest rooms, which I'm converting. One as a bedroom, one as an office. Toilet and shower stall on the first floor. And outside, a summer kitchen. I'll enter the yard through the garage. I've blocked off my half of the hall. Juan, don't do this. Just understand and forgive me. And you shouldn't have sent the kids videos of me. They're gonna hate me now. At least they will know what their mom is like and support my divorce from you. 
Juan, I was drunk. I didn't know what I was doing. Were you force-fed? That's it. Wait for the summons. Think about how we'll divide the property. I'll send you my proposals in a couple of days. The money on the joint card is yours. I took my half. Don't call me. Juan disconnected the phone. Isabella looked at her friend and sobbed. She asked, Dolores, what did I do in the video? I don't know. He didn't show me the video. What am I supposed to do now? Well, you've earned a hundred euros. Listen, that's a pretty low price. The girls on the bar charge more. You didn't even make a dollar and a half. You're completely devalued. Are you kidding me? Yes. What did you tell me when I warned you about Kira? She's so good, so loyal. She's always there for you. And today, you don't even remember what happened yesterday. You told me to keep my advice to myself. Remember, she also recommended that she has her eye on the vice principal. How come you're not in bed with him? She's a loyal friend who doesn't give bad advice. Are you going to mock me or help me? Okay. I see you've had enough. First, we need to figure out how you got so drunk as an asshole. I drank a little, in moderation. But then, after the dance, I had a little drink with Diana, some special cognac. She poured me two shots, and then it was just a blur. I see. Dolores picked up the phone and dialed some acquaintance, telling her, Maria, we were having a party and a friend got something in her drink. Can you draw some blood? Or anything you can do? After hearing the answer, Dolores continued, How lucky you're working. We'll be in your treatment room in 15 minutes. Told a friend, Get dressed. Let's go give blood. From a vein? Where else? Maybe from a finger? The friends quickly dressed and came to the clinic. The treatment room was open until 12. There were practically no people. Dolores entered the room, spoke to a nurse, and called Isabella. A pale Isabella walked into the room. She was panic-stricken from the injections. The nurse looked at her and said, Don't look at the arm, but talk to Dolores. Tied a tourniquet around her arm, quickly inserted a needle, and drew the required amount of blood. She said, I'll call you as soon as the test is done. We'll try to get it done today. The friends went outside, and Isabella decided, Dolores, thank you so much. I'm going home. The friends broke up. Toward evening, the nurse called and said, Listen, your girlfriend's been drugged with some kind of nasty stuff. We should go to the police. This is the fifth case in our city. All right, I'll call her right back. No matter how many times Dolores dialed Isabella, she didn't answer. I called Juan, told him what had happened, and he answered, What is this, a new excuse for debauchery? I'm not interested. Call her. As far as I can tell, she hasn't come home yet. I'm not looking for her lovers. I'm not interested. Isabella wasn't there on Sunday, and she didn't show up for work on Monday either. The weekend flew by, and Isabella still hadn't shown up. Juan started his car in the morning after breakfast and drove to work. He did not search for his missing wife. He didn't answer Dolores's calls. I'm not interested. Dolores came to work, but at the usual time, Isabella was not in the office nor was Diana. That's when Dolores thought about what might have happened. Most likely, Isabella had gone to Kira's to confront her. And something went wrong there. She called Juan, he answered. Come on, make it quick. I'm being introduced to the staff now. I've been appointed CEO. Long story short, Diane is not at work either, and neither is Isabella. So they're out with their dates. They've lost track of time. That doesn't sound like Isabella. What happened at the restaurant? Does that sound like her? Even if she was high, the naked truth came out of her. She's been drugged. Maybe she didn't make it home. Maybe she's in the hospital. Why are you talking about good things? He'll rest and heal. Okay, after the show, I'll take care of it. With a premonition of bad things to come, Dolores called the hospital. She asked, Tell me, did you have any women come in on Saturday with poisoning? No, no admissions, just trauma. Wasn't there a woman named Isabella among those admitted to the hospital? No, there isn't. And Diane's estate? There is one. Severe head injury. She's in intensive care under police guard. 
Guarded? Why would it be guarded? I don't know that. Juan walked into his new office after the introductions. The old boss handed him his files, which didn't take long. He wished him fruitful work and left. He too had a difficult morning today. Farewell to the team. And he invited Juan to his home tonight, by seven o'clock, with his wife, to celebrate his retirement. He said it would be just the family. Juan promised that he would definitely come, but he couldn't come with his wife because she had gone to her daughter's house. The cell phone rang, and Juan answered it. Hi, Juan. Haven't heard or seen you in ages, and now I have an excuse. Hey, Enrique, what did you find out about me being general manager? Hey, that's not a bad position. Congratulations on your career advancement. I'm still a lieutenant colonel. I'm still a colonel. Remember when you used to mock me? Captain, you'll never be a major. But I'm already a lieutenant colonel and chief of investigation. So, I'm calling you. In general, this is not a telephone conversation. Come to my office right now. Is it that urgent? Yeah. Chuckles. Okay, current affairs can wait. I'll tell my mom I'm going out. Juan gave orders to his deputy, baffled his secretary, Blanca, and left in the company car. Fifteen minutes later, he entered the office of the head of the investigation. Enrique rose to meet him, shook his hand, congratulated him on his position. He and Enrique had been friends since childhood, growing up in the same courtyard. After going to university, life separated them for a while. But then, when Enrique graduated from the academy, he was assigned to the place of residence. They began to meet again periodically, as much as their busyness allowed. Unlike Juan, Enrique was not married. Finished with a friendly hug, Enrique beckoned him to come with him. They walked to the front office. There, in an aquarium, sat men and women. Among the women, in a torn holiday dress, sat Isabella with her head down. Enrique asked, Is there anything you want to tell me? I don't even know what I can tell you. How did she get here? It's very simple. On Saturday, a squad went to a neighbor's call that someone was being murdered in the apartment next door. The victim, Diane, is almost unconscious. The apartment's a total wreck. Isabella's in the middle of it with a stool leg. Two patrolmen could barely hold her back. She kept trying to hit the victim. She explained to the patrolmen that they had a lover's quarrel, that Isabella came in out of the blue and caught them in bed. But how could she deal with them? It seems to be a side effect of the drug or whatever she was drugged with. It made her rage and gave her strength. They found drugs at the apartment, too. And the lover was detained? No, they didn't. They couldn't even identify him. He escaped without the neighbors seeing him. Diana pretends she's still unconscious and lying in the ICU under guard. So when the apartment was searched, cocaine was found. Or rather, first, a trace of it. Usually, sniffers do it to get it up their nose through a pipe. So they found cocaine on Isabella? No, on closer inspection of the apartment, they found cocaine, two bags of 500 grams, crack cocaine, a 500 gram bag and marijuana. Okay, now, what's the difference between cocaine and crack cocaine? Cocaine is a white powder derived from the leaves of the coca plant, which grows mainly in South America. It is usually consumed by snorting the powder through the nose, Crack is not a separate drug, but a stronger form of cocaine that is more easily addictive. Crack, or crystal cocaine, is mostly smoked. Cocaine is sometimes injected or eaten. And marijuana is a plant found in nature. It is usually mixed with tobacco, rolled into a joint, and smoked. But sometimes it is even cooked and eaten. Listen, I think I'm going to show you this video I made the other day. Juan scrolled through the tape of the restaurant scene. After watching it, Enrique noticed, a familiar face, lives off rich divorced women, widows. He often got into trouble and was beaten up, but he never filed a report. He's also been suspected of fraud, but he never got into drugs. I mean, you know him. We know he'll be here in an hour. And Isabella? What about Isabella? 
She spent the night at the TDF in a squat. The bodily harm was minor. No report, no case. Besides, she didn't identify herself. She said, put her in jail. I recognized her, so I didn't make a fuss. Then I'll ask you to release her and don't say I was here. Send her home somehow. If you want, I'll give her cab fare through you. She's got money and house keys in her purse and a cell phone, but the battery's dead. Is it something serious? Yeah, after Saturday night, I decided we should get a divorce. You saw the videotape. Plus, Diane says it was about a lover. What if that's true? And by the way, Dolores told me that they suspected something on Saturday, and Isabella had her blood tested and found some kind of narcotic substance. Okay, give me Dolores' phone number. I'll call her now and she'll take Isabella home. Dolores was on pins and needles. She had already called everything. Only the police were left. Then the phone rang from an unknown number, and she answered it. A familiar voice said, Hello, Dolores. It's Enrique. We met at a mutual friend's house, Juan and Isabella. Oh, Enrique, I remember you. Are you in the police force? Yes, I have the honor. That's what I need you for today. No problem. I'll meet you in my office at headquarters in 20 minutes. You work around here, don't you? You know everything. I'll be there soon. Indeed, Dolores was in Enrique's office 15 minutes later. She started at the door. Enrique, I think there's trouble with Isabella. Dolores, let's start with the incident at the restaurant. You know that too? Well, sort of, not completely. What were Santiago and Isabella doing when you found them in the conservatory? Isabella sat on a bench and, giggling foolishly, smoked. How long has she been smoking? She never smoked. What was she smoking? Oddly enough, a cigarette? What did you do? Well, I couldn't resist. Santiago was sitting so comfortably with his head bowed, just begging to be kicked in the face. And you did? I couldn't resist hitting you. And what about Isabella? When he was flying, he caught it, and the cigarette flew into the plants. It is a winter garden, after all. I shook Isabella and took her away, first to the hall, then to my house. She passed out on the way. How long do you think Isabella has known Santiago? No, she met him at a restaurant, on a bet with Diane. Does Diana know Santiago? I can't say that. I haven't seen them together. Can you show me where it was? Uh, sure. All right, let's go. Where to? To the conservatory. Half an hour later, Dolores, accompanied by Enrique, another operative and an investigator, entered the restaurant. The restaurant was still closed to the public, but the police entered without hindrance, using their official identification. They invited the witnesses and went into the winter garden. There, Dolores pointed out the bench where Santiago and Isabella were sitting and the direction in which the cigarette had flown. After a thorough examination of the place, the cigarette was found. It was shown to the witnesses and packed in a cellophane bag, which was sealed. The investigator drew up a seizure report. Left alone, Enrique asked, Dolores, what are you doing tonight? You know everything. Got it? Tonight, at 7.20 Gamoros p.m., we're meeting at the cafe near your house. It's open on Monday, too. Is this a date? I'm single. You're single, too. It wouldn't hurt our reputations. Also, maybe you're not alone. I'll be there. They returned to the department. The investigator questioned Dolores as a witness, and when the questioning was over, they brought Isabella, who had already been questioned by another employee. She had already told us who she was. When asked if she was married, she said, I don't know. The investigator returned Isabella's belongings that had been seized during the arrest and took her signature not to leave. He said, you must report to me at my first request. In the meantime, you're free to go. We walked out of the police building and stopped to wait for a cab. Isabella asked, Dolores, am I in trouble? I don't know. I'll try to find out, but you put Diana in the hospital. I decided to talk to her, so I went in. 
She opened the door for me in a naked robe. We went in, and Santiago was sitting there, and she said to me, Isabella, do you want to smell some snow? And she had a broken stool and a thick leg. So I took that leg. Diana saw what was going on, so she got hit in the head first, followed by me hitting Santiago. And Diane? What about Diana? She was passed out. She didn't think I was going to hit her, so she missed a shot. And this guy starts yelling at the whole house about how I'm being murdered. He already had a light under his eye. I was the one who kicked him in the conservatory on Friday. You don't remember. Do you even know it's Monday? I know, the TDF told me. I have to write a statement at my own expense, for a week. I can't come to my senses after that bum fest. And it's cold in there, in my party dress. What are you thinking of doing with Juan? He's being introduced to the team today by the CEO. Oh, really? Yeah. Chuckles. And my wife is in a cell with the homeless, and he didn't lift a finger to help me. What a husband. I'll divorce him myself. Isabella wept bitterly because of her self-pity. And whose fault is that? You didn't tell the police who you were. If you had, they would have called Juan and he would have gotten you out. He's got connections. I was ashamed. It's okay. You're finally ashamed. And it's your husband's fault. You're the one who messed up. Why are you reaching out to Diana? That's not all. I spent half an hour chasing Santiago around with a chair leg and occasionally hitting Diana. By the time the police showed up, I was about to finish her off with that leg. Santiago slipped out with his clothes in his hands while the cops disarmed me. Everything in the apartment was smashed and broken. What to do now? You'll be fine. The important thing is to calm down. Now you go home, take a bath, wait for Juan, and start making up with him. I'll stay out of your way and support you. On the phone. A cab pulled up. Isabella got in and drove off, and Dolores ran to work. There, alone in her office, she called Juan back. After a while, he answered, Juan, basically it's undeniable that Isabella was drugged, and your friend Enrique is on the case now. I know you think he got your cell phone from. And you didn't take Isabella home? Dolores, what happened on Friday still hurts my heart. And that's why what you're telling me now doesn't change anything. But, Juan, it's bad and hard for her right now. She's under so much stress, too. Besides, it would be easy for her to break up with me. Anyway, I'm working. Don't distract me. Meanwhile, the operatives figured out where Santiago was hiding. It was one of his old friends, an older woman who lived away from the center. It was to her that Santiago went, having intercepted a cab on the street on a call. There was a scandal in the dispatch room, which the operatives found out about. They found the driver, and he showed them where Santiago had gone in, in a torn shirt, with his face and head smashed in. Samantha bandaged, fed, dressed, and then the police arrived. They kept it short. Pack up and let's go. If you get weird, we'll add more. Santiago pulled himself together quickly. Samantha gave him a sneak peek, asking, For how long? No. Eight years. That's really how he's going to tell it. He was being questioned by an investigator in the department, and Enrique was present, also asking questions. When he saw Enrique, Santiago realized that he was in serious trouble. Enrique asked, Santiago, are you going to talk, or are you going to talk shit? Boss, let's not use the big mouth. Let's do it in a purely Patson way. You know who I am, what I do for a living. I don't steal. I don't rob, and I don't kill. I'm clean. Well, where'd you get the makeup? What kind of makeover? Which you made a path, but didn't have time to sniff, and offered it to a lady. No, I'm not going to suggest anything to anyone. Drugs are evil. Here, and you're going to talk honestly, like a boy. And you won't. Look, I'll lock you up. I think Diana will sing when she hears how much time she's looking at. You'll share a cell with Lapata. What does this have to do with Shovel? Aren't you guys friends? He had a disagreement with his wife, and now he's serving 15 days. I can't put him in jail with thieves. I can't put him with convicts either. He'll hurt them. You can't go to the thieves. They've been waiting for you for a long time, with the Pair Deemers, 
Not the same rank, only to Lapata, alone. There's only one bunk there, but I bet you'll sleep on the toilet. Come on, I get it. The coke's not mine. Diana's giving it to me. What am I supposed to do? You should see how ugly these old ladies are. You can't get in bed with them without a hit. Your guys saw Samantha. She's in her 60s and still wants a hot man. Okay, did you buy marijuana for a woman in a restaurant? In the conservatory. That's the same woman who did me and Diana. Now, let's talk about this one a little bit more. What's more to it than that? That's it. You're lying. I'm lying. If I tell, I'll be killed for sure. And it doesn't matter where I'll be, on the outside or in the zone. No. If you say A, say B. Can I think about it? How much? See you in the morning. You can do it till morning, but I won't be interested in the morning. I'll be talking to Diana. What about Diana? She's the one who ordered me this broad. She made 500 bucks off one guy she knew, but she promised to give her to the other guy for the night. To whom? Well, the one who paid the bucks. His name is Rodrigo. He's from their company. The other one is a serious guy, a close friend of Rodrigo's, who supplies Diana with drugs, mostly makeup and marijuana. He's a little stronger than that. He's a merchant himself and only communicates with bargains. Far me guy. And they already give the goods to their guys. And who is he, this merchant? I've never seen him. He doesn't go to Diana. She goes to him herself for a day or two, or even a week. She told me to get this Isabella girl in a cab, and then put her in a cab, and she'd get in and take her where she said she'd go. I did it, and after she smoked some weed, she was supposed to pass out in 15 minutes. But that woman ruined it by kicking me in the face. Plus, she seemed to know me. She stole Isabella, and from what I understand, they got in the car and drove off. Good. Now come on, think. What you just told me is aiding and abetting kidnapping for sexual exploitation. I didn't think it was that serious. Who is the merchant? How do we find him? Yeah, Diana always took a cab to his place. All right. When the investigator interrogates you, you'll tell him everything. What's wrong with you, boss? I'm going to get pen palized. Agreed, yes. I gave pot to a woman I met in a restaurant to get her to like me. I bought the weed from a person I didn't know for my own personal use. That's great. Let's keep it that way. I'd name the merchant just off the record. Off the record? Am I writing something? This is the general director of a firm that is a leader here in the city. They have a trucking department with three drivers on trucks, hauling goods from Central Asia. The cars are equipped with hiding places. Now the merchant is retiring, but he still has control over the company. He's one of the founders. How do you know? Yeah, Diana told me. That woman in the restaurant, the one they were trying to set up, is the wife of the new CEO. I guess they were trying to get dirt on him so he danced to their tune. The woman's a fool. It took Diana a month to set her up. In a tavern, trying to get a man, she set me up for her by pouring her some crap beforehand. While I was dancing with her, I thought she was going to lay me out on the dance floor. I took her to my place in the winter garden, we just started kissing, and then her man showed up. He had a bit of a row and left. She giggled, but I guess something in her head clicked. She slid off her knees, and then I slipped her a joint. She took five hits, and then her friend came in. Next thing you know, Warden. All right, I'll lock you up alone so no one can hurt you. Enrique thought for a moment. An interesting picture was emerging. One of the powerful streams flooding the city with drugs had been found, and it had to be handled very carefully. It was clear that Isabella was being used to get dirt on Juan, and if they didn't succeed now with his wife, there would be other attempts. Unfortunately, Santiago is right, Isabella is a complete fool, but her inadequate behavior is what started this promotion. Enrique dialed Juan's number, who answered, Hi, again. Hey, can you talk? Yeah, I'm in the office alone. No, it's not over the phone. Let's meet at the cafe at 6 p.m., near Dolores' house. I always eat there, and tonight I've made a date with her for seven nights. What, you got me? She's a good-looking woman. 
I'll be there at six duwags, but not for long. I have to change, buy a present. I'm invited to the former CEO Andres's house today to celebrate his retirement. All right, I'll see you at 5.30. I promise I won't keep you long. How's it going with Isabella's case? All right, we're on it. Andres was getting ready to welcome guests on the occasion of his retirement. There was plenty of time before the guests arrived. No, he could still sit where he was, and not for a year, because he was full of strength and energy. But he felt it was time to leave. There were many reasons. He'd squeezed a lot out of this company he'd co-founded. The main founder was Rodrigo, an engineer by training. Andres hired Rodrigo's fellow student, Juan, as his deputy, and he proposed him to replace him as general director. Secretly, he expected that Rodrigo would decide to run the company himself and would want him to be appointed. But everything went wrong, and Juan was approved as general manager. Andres had known about it a month before the appointment. He knew everything about André. An impeccable worker, a demanding manager who could both punish and encourage. Honest. Honesty and truthfulness intimidated Andres. Over many years, receiving instructions from a boss he had never met, secretly from Rodrigo, he had built up an extensive drug distribution network. He had established stable ties with drug dealers in Central Asia. The company's fleet of vehicles included six cars with elaborate hiding places. Moreover, each cache was not repeated in any of the cars in terms of design and location. Needless to say, the drivers on these cars were proven people who did their work for a good raise in salary. They were led by the garage manager, but he did not know the main manager. He received instructions through SMS messages. Andres himself was also a big conspirator. After all, he himself started, once in his youth, a pusher, had his own point, and his clientele. He'd seen how his colleagues in the trade burned. Some of them were turned in by drug addicts themselves, some of them were tied up on a test purchase, some of them couldn't stand it and started using the goods themselves and turned from a pusher into a pusher. But Andres managed to rise up and eventually become a merchant. He was led to it by a boss, unknown to himself. And Andres managed to make the merchants take goods only from him. The actions of competitors were rigidly suppressed, not bending to anything. Being the general director, in order to ensure the safety of the enterprise, on the instructions of the chief, he created a separate department. He put at the head of it a man, named by the chief, who controlled everything and everyone. He, having certain connections, collected information on those whom Andres pointed out. He also had one-time performers. From the information on Juan, I knew that his family came first, that he loves his wife very much and never argues with her. That's the note he decided to play. By getting dirt on his wife, it would be possible to blackmail Juan into illegal drug operations. The chief agreed to it. They decided to use a trump card. Andres's longtime lover, Diana. With her, he was connected since the time when she studied at the third year of university, and he, by this time, became a stable dealer, and she tried to divorce him. But the clever Andres quickly figured it out. And since then, she had become his call girl, which, in general, did not bother her at all. By happy coincidence, Diana worked in the same office with Isabella, and even, moreover, they had studied together earlier. Except something didn't work out for Diana at the pub. After calling him on Saturday morning, she stopped answering his calls. At the same time, Juan, invited to his house to celebrate his retirement, suddenly said that his wife had gone to his daughter. So, he made a decision. Do not force anything today until the situation is clarified. He instructed the head of security to check the situation. Enrique arrived at the hospital. Before visiting the room where Diana was lying, he talked to the attending doctor. The doctor said, She's healthy. The bruises and battering will wear off in time. Yes, she's been through a lot but it's not fatal. I don't see any reason to keep her here and I insist she be discharged. Every seat in this place is worth its weight in gold. But I'm told she faints at times. She loses her conscience sometimes. She's just pretending. 
You can't fool the instruments, but she can't see them. We'll pick it up today. Yeah, you should bring her some clothes. Wasn't she wearing anything? The ambulance actually brought her in naked, in a torn robe. No underwear. Enrique called back to his brother-in-law and said, I didn't want to disturb you, but you'll have to go to Diana's house, get her some clothes and bring them to the hospital. She's being discharged, so we'll move her to the detention center. Enrique, what kind of clothes do you need? It'll be cold soon, and they won't give her a jacket right away. Until the investigation is over, and take Valentina with you. What's she for? Who's gonna search her? You? Got it. I'm on my way. Enrique went into the room. There, smiling cheerfully at the guard, lay alone Diana. When she saw him enter, she made an unhappy face and groaned. Enrique smiled and asked, Diana, you were just smiling. I'm the head of the criminal investigation department. It comes over me in waves. Suddenly everything goes dark and I pass out. Good thing I have security and that crazy girlfriend won't break in here. So what happened with her? Yes, on Friday she met a young man in a restaurant, or rather, she knew him before, and I took him away at the end of the night. Well, he didn't want to go with her, so he went to my place. And she came in the morning, saw him, and made a mess. Who's that man? I don't know. I'm not that familiar with him. But I spent the night with him. What did I do wrong with that? Makes sense, but you didn't ask for a name. I don't need it. Are you going to report your friend? I don't know what to do. I feel sorry for her. She seems like a nice woman. I see. Just one more thing. You're wrong about the guards. It's not a guard. It's an escort. I'm guessing about 12 years your senior. Me? For what? What did I do? Santiago. We found, and now we know everything. The question is, who will be the first to tell the truth? Faster and bigger. And we're moving you from here to the detention center today. Don't lose consciousness. The doctor said it's a hoax, you're healthy, and the bruises will go away. What a bastard. Who? A doctor? Santiago? A rotten man on retainer. But honestly, it's not him we're interested in, it's Andres. Who's that? Well, have you forgotten who put you in bed with Isabella? Who supplied you with the drugs? What drugs? They were found at the scene of your apartment massacre. So Isabella gave it to me. Diane, you're being weird. I tell you your supplier as a fait accompli, and you're trying to avoid answering me. Look, we pretty much know everything. The evidence against you is overwhelming. Serious evidence. Especially since there are fingerprints on the packages, and they've already been compared to your prints. They're a match. The coroner's office has the expert report. Who are you? Me? I'll introduce myself again. I'm the head of the criminal investigation department. Tell me honestly and openly. Are we going to talk? Or do you really need to serve 12 years to realize that you're in serious trouble? Can I think about it? You can. Today, right now, you'll be transferred to the detention center. That's where you'll stay for the duration of the investigation. How about a subscription? Well, you don't want to cooperate? Let's just say the attempted kidnapping of Isabella. I'm no longer interested in how you did it or what. I already know that. Where you wanted to take her will be determined by the end of the day. It's the same place you used to take Andres on his dates. He's not stupid, and he didn't take you to his house. That's where his wife is. Andres is a rich man, and he won't rent a cheap motel to meet you. But tonight, it's tolerated. If I cooperate with the investigation, do I get credit for that? I think you can realistically shorten your sentence. Okay, I'm ready to talk. She was to be taken to the company's security training base. There are two cottages next to the base, and not everyone knows this. They are registered to front men who are long gone. Sometimes they are lived in by people invited to run one-off errands. Killers? It depends on the nature of the errand. Then where do they go? After completing the assignment, they get a settlement and leave. Only Andres can contact them. Doesn't he waste them? No. 
It's not a market where you can do that. Moreover, the settlements with them are carefully controlled. By whom? I don't know that, but I do know that there have been no complaints about Andres. How do you know? In the region, a business like Andres is controlled. You have to pay a certain fee on your income. And the control there is stricter than that of the Federal Tax Service. Once, when I was at Andres's place, a man came to see him, but I didn't see him. I was told to go upstairs to my bedroom and keep my head down. But I overheard a conversation. The man was unhappy with the deductions and asked for an increase. Andres agreed, but on the condition that he would get help in capturing a few markets in the region. The man said, We know your competitors. They have behaved dishonestly towards us. If you push them out of the market, there will be no objection. So he gave him carte blanche to redistribute the market of the region? Regions? It's not just the region. Andres has long been a transit base for the capital. That's where he's tied up with the nightclubs. Who on his team is the most dangerous? I'm guessing the head of security. Andres works with him, but he doesn't trust him, and he's afraid of him. He knows even more than Andres does. Why is Andres afraid of him? Someone leaks information about him to those who control his activities, and a man may one day be sent to him with a one-time assignment. Why does he need Isabella? Doesn't he have enough women? Make a video of her and keep Juan on a short leash and eventually get him into the business. Would he be filming himself? No. There was someone to put with her, and not just one. What about Juan filing for divorce after Isabella's antics? He thought Juan loved her. And she, as a close friend of mine, told me that Juan would wash her feet and drink that water. That he was on a short leash. That's what we were counting on. But that stupid Dolores got in. Who's Dolores? She's an old friend of Isabella's. When I showed up, I pushed her aside. But at the restaurant, she's the one who got Isabella out of trouble. I thought Juan would beat up Santiago, start a scandal, and since Isabella was already there, I'd take her to my house. If anything, I'd say she ran away on the way. Did Santiago know about this? No, he knew, not all of it. Because he doesn't like to get beaten up, and he doesn't know how to fight. 